Okay, well, welcome to the Monday seminar. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm really happy to say that Virginia Durand is uh, here to give a talk to us today. Um, she is doing it under some duress because uh, she's having a hard time sitting, and uh, that's which is possibly the only way to give a talk like this. But um, thank you very much, Virginia, for being here. Um, we'll follow our normal procedure with uh, quite an informal operation, uh, but we would like you to mute yourself at, at least at the beginning right now and do what you like with your camera. Um, and if there's points of clarification, yeah, just unmute and ask. I think that will be fine with Virginia. And at the, at the end, we'll have an extensive discussion up to probably around a half an hour or so. So please prepare to uh, join in to that discussion with questions and things at the end, because I think it is important to remember that giving a talk into a computer screen is not the most exciting thing to do in the world, but there is a, a little bit of an advantage to this format because it allows us to have a discussion at the end that's longer than you might be able to do in a, a normal uh, venue. So with that, Virginia, thank you very much for being here and I'll turn things over to you. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks, Chris, for, for the invitation to, to give a seminar in, uh, in this series. So here I will uh, present you the study that we did with uh, the seismic signals generated by the rock falls to highlight the impact of the repetitive small seismic events on the destabilization of the metastable system. And I will show you the example of the piton la fournaise volcano in uh, La Réunion Island. So how you can see, um, I mean, as you can see here, this work has been done in collaboration with a lot of people with various institutes in France and in uh, Germany. And I would like to particularly acknowledge uh, the help and the involvement of the people from the observatory of the piton la fournaise uh, volcano. So, yeah. So um, the slope instabilities are phenomena that are controlled by uh, gravity and uh, also by time. I mean, and they um, they exist at different time scales and also uh, uh, scales. So we have the giant uh, landslides that are a few thousand tens or even hundreds of thousands of cubic meters and that will be uh, quite slow, that can last several years, but that will know some episode of uh, accelerations. Then on the other side of the spectrum, we have the rockfalls that are much smaller with uh, size between uh, one cubic meter to tens or even thousands of uh, cubic meters. And they are usually pretty fast with a duration of few seconds, maximum a few minutes. And in between you have um, some uh, other uh, phenomena like debris flows, like this example on the right uh, in Martinique. So they, they are bigger than the rock falls between thousands to um, 10 or hundreds of thousands of cubic meters. And they are a bit slower, but they are still quite fast uh, with durations from minutes to hours. So um, the slope instabilities can be triggered by earthquakes by rain, but also simply by time with the gravity that after a while, the loading makes them uh, fall. So all these uh, slope instabilities have a high human and economical uh, impact. So they are responsible of around 5,000 uh, deaths per year and also uh, several billions per year of loss due to uh, the damages to the infrastructure. But in addition to this um, human questions, let's say problematics, um, they also raise some scientific questions. So the main ones concern uh, the triggering of these slope instabilities and how they will begin. So actually, it's basically the same question that we want to answer for earthquakes as well. How an earthquake will begin, how the slope instability will begin, and what will uh, trigger them. So more specifically, what we're interested in here, it's the influence of the external factors on uh, the triggering of the slope instabilities. So the external factors can be the climate, the seismicity, the volcanic uh, activity, among others. And we want to understand by which mechanisms these external factors can have an impact on the slope instabilities. So 
We can think that uh, compared to earthquakes, the slope instabilities are pretty easy to study because we can have direct observations. However, for that, we need to be at the right place at the right moment, and it's not always uh, the case. So we lack um, accurate and systematic observations. But actually, I should say we lacked because now uh, we have some new methodology and new instruments that allow us to have a more systematic observation of these phenomena. So for example, we can use uh, the seismic records of the seismic signals that are generated by the slope instabilities to detect them, locate them, and estimate their volume. And we also have some new kinds of uh, direct observations, with, for example, continuous uh, LIDAR measurements or uh, putting some cameras that are filming uh, continuously. More detailed uh, studies, and so it's helping to improve our understanding of these uh, phenomena. So for the study I present you, I bring you to the Piton La Fournaise uh, volcan volcano that is on uh, La Réunion Island. And this volcano is particularly interesting for actually several uh, reasons. So first, the crater floor of this volcano collapsed in 2007. And by uh, collapsing, it reveals some uh, very steep slopes. And uh, the depth of the crater now is 300 meters. So since this collapse, we can observe uh, numerous rockfalls inside the crater. Also, there is a dense array of uh, instrumentation at the summit of the volcano. So we have some uh, seismic stations with a uh, white dot here, some uh, GNSS uh, stations as well, the black dots, some uh, rain gauges, and some uh, cameras around the crater. And all this instrument instrumentation is in place for now more than 10 years. And uh, in this context, we have actually a volcano that is uh, very active and that has regular eruptions that are accompanied by small seismic events that I will call in the following the volcan volcano tectonic events. So they are very small events because their uh, average man magnitude is 0 0.6 and the maximum magnitude was uh, 3.8 and it was at the time of the crater floor collapse. So we can really uh, study the impact of the small seismicity on the destabilization of the slopes in the crater. And finally, uh, in this region, the slopes are exposed to several external forcing. So we have the seismicity that is linked to the volcanic activity. We have the deformation of uh, the volcano when we have the magma, uh, some intrusion of uh, magma. And it's in a tropical area, so we have quite a lot of uh, rain as well. So uh, I'll show you which kind of uh, instrument we use for this uh, study and the methods that we apply. So on the volcano uh, of the Piton de la Fournaise, as I told you, we have different kinds of instruments. So we have uh, some photogrammetry with uh, LIDAR and uh, photographies that allow us to have some digital elevation models. And by doing the difference in between uh, two digital elevation models, we can access to the total volume of rockfalls that occurred uh, during the period. We also have uh, the cameras. So this means that we don't need to be at the right place at the right moment. They are filming continuously, so during uh, daylight. So we still have a gap in uh, during the night. But we also have uh, seismic uh, stations. So here I show you an example of the seismic station in uh, in the Dolomites in Italy, actually, because it was the best picture I had of the setting. But we have exactly the same on the volcano with the solar, the solar panels, and the digitizer. So I will focus mainly on the signal recorded by these uh, seismic stations. So they allow us to have a real-time recording, continuous, uh, day, night, whatever the, the time. We can locate each event individually and so have also a precise occurrence time for each event. And we can determine the size of the event um, via the seismic energy so we can access the volume of the rockfalls. But on the Piton La Fournaise, the, these stations are not only recording uh, rockfalls. We also uh, record the volcano tectonic events and some regional earthquakes. However, 
because they have um, different enough characteristics to be uh, separated automatically. So if you look at the different characteristic of these signals for the rock falls, first we have an emerging arrival. So it means that the time between the, uh, the first on onset of the signal and the maximum amplitude is pretty long um, compared to the to the total time of the to, uh, total duration of the event. Whereas, for example, for a volcano tectonic event, this time will be very short. Then they have a quite a long duration between 30 and 200 seconds. And if we look now at the frequency content of these signals, they also have a characteristic shape that we call a cigar uh, shape. They are compressed between uh, 2 and 25 hertz. And for example, this helps to discriminate them from the regional earthquakes that are much uh, lower frequency. So with all with these characteristics, we can extract the signal of only the rock falls and process them. So I will show you now what we use to process the seismic signal to have uh, the occurrence time of the earthquake, the location, and the size of the rock falls. So, so as for earthquake, we need to pick the first arrival of the signal to be able to locate it after. However, it's a bit more tricky because of this uh, emergent arrival. So to manage to pick it pretty precisely, we use a kurtosis uh, method to that actually identify uh, the transition between noise and, uh, and signal. And this transition is the arrival of the seismic wave. So we compute a characteristic function that is uh, based on the kurtosis in a sliding uh, window. And you can see that at the time um, between the trans, I mean, of the transition between the noise and the signal, we have an increase of this characteristic function. Here is a zoom. So you see that, yeah, at the beginning, really, of the signal, we have this increase. And so to pick it more um, precisely, we transform this characteristic function to finally pick the minimum of this uh, function. So now that we have the first arrival, we can locate the events. So we have only one arrival. We cannot have, I mean, we do not have a P wave and a S wave. So we need to find a method using only a, a one arrival. So we use a hyperbola method and it's based on the differences of travel times and the stacking of the resulting hyperbolas. So to explain you on an example, here I show you the time differences between the BOR station here and the SNE station. So for um, these two stations, we compute a theoretical delay map where we compute um, the time difference of the arrivals at these two stations for each point of this map. And then we compare it with the observed uh, time difference and it gives us this map where you see that we have an area here in greenish where we have this um, time difference between the observed and um, computed uh, delays that is close to zero. So we extract this um, area that represent hyperbola. We have it here. And we do that for all the pairs of stations. And of course, we stack all these hyperbolas. And uh, the highest probability uh, for the location of the rockfall will be where the highest number of hyperbolas will um, cross. So in this case, the the event would be located on the north system uh, side of the crater. So now that we have the location of the events, we can um, determine that their size. However, before computing the volume, we need to correct from side effect cor um, from side effects. Indeed, the stations on the Piton de Fornes volcano are on a very heterogeneous medium. So we can have some very local amplification, and we need to get rid of this amplification to have um, a real, let's say, estimate of the, of the volume. So for this, we use the volcano tectonic events that have a high uh, signal over noise ratio, like this one, for example. And since the volcano tectonic events are located uh, two kilometers below the crater, and that all our stations are all around the crater, we make the hypothesis that in the amplitude of the signal, the only difference will be due 
to the local effect and uh, not nothing on the path between the event and the and the stations. So we compare the Fourier transform at all the stations and we extract a reference station. And as a reference station, we take the station with the less amplification and the most homogeneous uh, Fourier transform uh, on all the frequency. Then we compute an amplification factor for all the stations and we can correct the signal by taking the inverse. So here I show you the example at the BOR station that is located uh, here on the western uh, side of the of the crater. It's actually the most uh, amplified station, so it can be due to the medium below. But you can see that it's also at a kind of a corner with the main crater, and you have a smaller crater, and the station is just here, so it can also be due to amplification due to the geometry uh, around the station. But so we apply this uh, kind of correction to all the signals that we have at uh, all the stations. So once we uh, correct the signal, we can now estimate the volumes. And to estimate the volumes, we need the um, seismic energy and the ratio between the seismic energy and the potential energy. So for L, uh, it is the length over which a rockfall will uh, occur, and theta is the um, angle of the slopes. And for this, we take some averages depending on where we are around the crater. So to compute the seismic energy, we make the hypothesis that we have on the surface waves. And so, yeah, we compute the seismic energy following this uh, formula with the time T1 and T2 being the onset of the seismic signal of the rockfall and uh, the, um, the end of the seismic signal. We use the squared envelope of the signal and um, the characteristic in um, the thickness of the layer of, through which the surface waves are propagating also takes the uh, wave velocity of surface waves. And R is the uh, distance between the station and uh, the event. Once we have the seismic energy, we still need some the estimation of the potential energy to have the ratio. And for this, we generate a uh, few hundreds of uh, numerical simulations. So for this, we use the digital elevation models that we have of the crater, and we extract some profiles in some areas where we have good constraints of the path of the rockfalls, thanks to the cameras. And we uh, do this numerical simulation, so for a set of uh, typical events with an initial mass, and we know the runout from the cameras. And so we simulate it on this profile, for example, like this. And uh, we are using a code that is called Shaltop, and that gives us, at, um, as an output, the potential energy and the event duration. So now we can plot together the seismic energy and the potential energy versus uh, the duration of the events. So in red, you have the potential energies. In uh, the other colors, it's all the seismic energy of all the rockfalls that has been uh, detected. So you can see that they follow the same uh, linear trend, but with a shift. And so from this, we can make the, the ratio of these uh, linear trends, and we can finally access to the volume of the rockfalls. So here I show you the results of this processing for two years of data from 2014 to 2018. So a quick analysis of this is that, uh, yeah, we have uh, mainly an active zone on the northwest uh, slope of the crater. The rest of the crater is pretty much uh, inactive in terms of uh, rockfalls. And yeah, you notice that on the color scale, I put the volumes at the power one third. So it's not to make you think too much to how much it means in uh, cubic meters, but it's because after I will compare these results with the results from the photogrammetry. And the photogrammetry actually gives us the, the surface change and so the height change um, during the, the rockfalls. Virginia, so, oh, yeah. sorry, it's Chris. Could you go back two slides? Because I realized I didn't catch the colors that are on this, this slide. Red is which? 
Uh, yeah, uh, so red is the potential energy that we simulated for uh, 100 uh, scenarios. OK. And the colors are actually uh, the seismic energy um, computed for each of the stations at the top of the crater. And what we do is that we actually compute this ratio for each station. And to compute the volume, we take the average of the ratio. Gotcha. OK. OK. Thank you. Um, so here yeah, is the um, results using uh, photogrammetry. So we had two campaign of measurements, one in 2014 using a LIDAR and one in 2016 using some uh, photography. So this is uh, done with uh, German uh, collaborators. They were the experts uh, for that. So they used these two um, uh, digital elevation models that were obtained by the different measurements. And the difference between these two digital elevation models gives the total volume of the rock falls that occurred during this period. Mm -hmm. So here on the left, it was just to show you that we have um, it's a zoom on the most active uh, zone of the crater. So we see um, the lack of uh, materials and the deposit um, um, at the bottom of the, of the slope. And here is a result for actually only half of the crater, because uh, for the moment, only half is uh, processed of the data. We need, we miss still the, the other half. So we can compare only the western uh, half of the, of the crater. And here, so yeah, I'm sorry, the colors are reversed. So the um, uh, warm colors are the missing uh, materials and the blue colors represent the deposits. And from uh, this uh, difference between the two uh, DMs, that they uh, estimate the total volume that fell during the two years in between the, the measurements, that is of the order of 79 cubic meters. So if we compare with the estimations that we have with the seismic uh, signals, we see that we tend to overestimate the, the volumes with the seismic um, signals, but we are still in the same order of, uh, of magnitude. So, And we also see that the most active zone of the crater is this uh, northwest area. So it makes us more confident in uh, what we are doing with the seismic uh, signal. Um, if you compare carefully the two maps, you see that uh, here on the southern part of the crater, with the photogrammetry, we actually see something um, that we don't see with the seismic data. But actually, with the photogrammetry data, you see that there is only a missing material, and we don't have the corresponding uh, deposit. So the hypothesis is that uh, this part is actually subsiding, and quite slowly. So we can see the difference between the, the measurements made at two years interval, but we don't see anything in the seismicity. So to summarize uh, the comparison between the two methods, so the seismic signals give us uh, access to the individual volumes, and we have information on the number of rockfalls and on their occurrence times. Whereas with um, the photogrammetry uh, measurements, we have a direct estimation of the volume, so it might be more precise. But we only have access to a total volume, and we have no information on the number of rockfalls, nor on their occurrence time. So it's for that on the following, I'm really focusing on the data uh, coming from the seismic uh, stations. And we will uh, analyze the spatial temporal evolution of the rockfalls. So we did the same uh, processing over a period of uh, 10 years where we so we detected the rockfalls and we estimated their, their volumes. So we began just after the collapse of the crater, and we have 10 years until the end of uh, 2017. So here I show you in black is the cumulative number of the rockfalls, and in brown it's the cumulative volume of the rockfalls. So the first observation that we can do is that it's not the activity is not constant over time. We have some jumps sometimes. We also have this large increase after the, the collapse. And so what I will do in the following of the talk is to compare um, this rockfall activity to the eruption activity and also to the rain and the volcano tectonic activity. But first, we can see that some increases 
of the number of rock falls can correlate with uh, some eruptions. But uh, before going to the detailed analysis, I just want to show you quickly the frequency, volume frequency di uh, distribution. So it's comparable to the Gutenberg Richter law for uh, earthquakes. So I have the number of rock falls with a volume greater than a given volume and the volume uh, in uh, the X axis. And so you can see that between approximately 20 uh, cubic meters square and 20,000 cubic meters square, we have quite a linear uh, trend with a B value also co comparable with the earthquake one. Uh, the smallest volume is actually the threshold for the detection. So on the whole period, we can actually detect uh, volumes down to uh, 10 or 20 uh, cubic meters. But you also see that we have a lack of large rockfalls. Um, and this hypothesis here that we do is that the crater walls have a finite size. So once a large rockfall happens, it needs time to reload uh, after. And the time needed might be longer than the 10 years of the data that we have uh, here. And so this could explain this lack of uh, large rockfalls. Um, now I do the same, but on different periods that uh, I chose dependent on the eruption periods. So the red one, yeah, I'm sorry for the color. So you have a red curve here and a green curve just uh, below. So the red curve is um, for the time, the two years just after the collapse of the crater. And the green curve is for the first set of eruptions after the collapse. And what we see with these two curves is that we lack uh, small events. So typically uh, events with volume lower than 100 cubic meters. So we have a higher detection threshold. And this can be due either to the fact that um, it's very, very active with a lot of volcano tectonic events and also a lot of events linked to the uh, collapse. And so we cannot detect all the rockfalls, but also uh, we can think that uh, the system is in a super critical state and that the steep slopes are actually drained more by large rockfalls than by small uh, events. Now, if we look at the two other curves, the blue and the um, purple one, we observe the contrary. We have more uh, small events, but we clearly lack um, large events. And so this might be because the system has been drained in terms of large rockfalls during the previous periods, and so it needs time to reload. So in the following, I will take uh, all the volumes greater than 100 cubic meters to be sure not to miss events in the two first uh, periods following the, the crater collapse. So just quickly to show you a bit the, um, the spatial uh, distribution of the rockfalls. So here I show you only the rockfall with a volume greater than 5,000 cubic meters because all the smaller rockfalls actually they are constantly all around the, the crater uh, vault, um, all around the crater. It doesn't change with, uh, with time. Whereas if we look at the largest uh, rockfalls, we see that, okay, right after the collapse, it's the wool crater that is unstable. The slopes are actually um, generated a lot of rockfalls and of large rockfalls. During the first uh, set of uh, eruptions, it's a bit less active in terms of uh, rockfalls, but we still have this uh, northeast area that is very active with uh, the largest actually rockfalls that occur in the whole period. And it actually represents the steepest, uh, steepest slopes. Then we have a period with no uh, eruption and it's much more quiet around the, the crater and mainly in this uh, steep area that has been drained. And now for a few years, it doesn't produce any uh, large rockfall anymore. And then when we have again some uh, eruptions, we again have a kind of homogeneous uh, activation of the, of the crater. So now I will focus on the temporal evolution and I will compare with the different times and the different external forcings. So first I focus on the time after the collapse here until uh, 2009. And actually we can uh, very nicely fit an Omori law. So the Omori law gives you the rate of events depending on the time after the main event. So usually a big earthquake, I mean an earthquake, 
but now I take as the time of the main event, the time of the collapse. And so it's usually used to describe the temporal evolution of the aftershocks activity after a main earthquake, but it can actually be used to um, describe the temporal evolution of, let's say, aftershocks of the collapse of the, of the crater. And it actually uh, allows us to quantify the relaxation of the crater wall following the, co the collapse of the crater. And this, um, this relaxation is lasting two years and a half, actually until the end of uh, 2009. And it seems that during this period, you can see that the rockfall activity is controlled only by the relaxation of the crater walls. Because if you look in, uh, at the end of 2009, you see that when you have the eruptions, you also have an increase of the rockfall activity. It's the same for 2011. But in, at the end of 2008, there is nothing. It's just, yeah, the crater walls are just responding to the collapse, relaxing, and that's all. So it's also what I show you uh, here. This time I compare with the seismic activity on the lower plot in uh, black and the rainfall uh, activity in blue. So if you look at the seismicity, you see that at the end of uh, 2008, you have the largest increase in the seismic uh, rate on the whole period of uh, observation. And still there is nothing in the rockfall activity uh, showing a link with um, volcano tectonic events. So when the slopes are very unstable, they are not responsive uh, to the external forcings. Now, if we, if we look at two years and a half after the collapse, we might say that uh, now the seismicity triggers an increase of the rockfall activity. And we also observe it in a latest time, but in a less, um, less clear manner. So yeah, from 2010, we have the increases in the rockfall activity that seem to correlate with the seismic activity and also the, rock, uh, the rainfalls. For example, here in 2013, we have this increase of the rockfall activity corresponding to an increase in the rainfall. However, we can wonder if these increases that we observe are really linked to the external forcings or if they are due to internal interactions. Because when you have a rockfall, I mean, it's a bit like is a earthquake, it can trigger other rockfalls. So you can have some internal um, interactions that can create this uh, increase in the activity. So to be sure that what we observe is really due to the external forcing and not to, um, the, inter to the external forcing and not to the internal um, interactions, we need to remove all these uh, internal interactions. And so for this, we decluster uh, our rockfall catalog using the method developed for earthquakes by Zalia Pinetal uh, 2008. So as, there, as they did, we use a rescale distance and a rescale time. And we actually obtain a bimodal uh, distribution where on one side we have the parents, so the background rockfall activity. And on the other side, we have the children or the clusters. So we can still have some clusters in the background activity, but they are not any more statistically uh, significant. So here I show you the result of the declustering. So in black, you have the cumulative number of rockfalls uh, for the wool catalog. In dark blue, you have the same for the declustered uh, catalog and the light dashed line, uh, blue dashed line is for the clusters. So the first thing that you can see is that during the relaxation of the crater, we mainly have clusters, so cascade of, uh, of events. But it's actually what we expect since with this Omorilo, we could say that they were aftershocks of the collapse. And if you look in the following years, you see that there are sometimes you have some uh, cluster activities that correspond to increase in the global uh, catalog. But you still see these increases in the declustered uh, catalog. So we can say that uh, the behavior that we see, that we observe of these increases is kind of real and linked to external forcings and not only due to clusters. So in the following, I will show you the results for the wool catalog because visually it's better to see what I want to show you, but we did exactly the same analysis 
with a declustered catalog, and we obtain exactly the same results and uh, conclusions. So now I will um, show you really the comparison between the raw force and the external forcings. So here I show the number of uh, volcano tectonics events in black, and this is the number of events summed on sliding window of 15 days. And I show you the same for the rock falls in uh, red. And if we don't look at the first part where we know that we have the relaxation of the crater walls and that they are not responsive, but if we begin to look at the end of 2009, I mean, it's quite clear that we have a correlation between uh, the increase of um, volcano tectonic activity and the increase of rockfall activity. So it's, in my opinion, it's pretty clear for this um, period from 2010, 2011. There is still some correlation uh, for the period from 2014 uh, to 2018, but it's maybe a bit less clear. We have the increases of the rockfall that are um, smaller. And also we seem to observe a delay between the seismic activity and the rockfall activity. So this difference of behavior can be explained by several uh, hypotheses. First, you see that uh, from 2010 to 2011, we have the seismic activity that is quite strong, but on extended um, time uh, periods. So we have maybe, I mean, more events in more time, whereas from 2014, you have these huge peaks of uh, seismic activity that are actually burst. They are very intense, but very short. And so maybe they are too short to uh, destabilize as, as much the crater walls. And also one last thing is that um, in 2010 and 11, we are just after the crater floor collapse. So the walls of the crater might be still unstable. Whereas in 2014, it's after three years with no eruption, no seismicity. So the crater slopes might be more stable and so less easy to uh, destabilize. And finally, so one last thing is that we have this period here from 2011, 2014, where we have nearly no seismicity. And this actually is very interesting because we can study more um, independently the effect of the rain on the rock falls. So it's what I show you uh, here. So I did the same. In blue, you have the rain summed on uh, sliding windows of 15 days compared to the rock falls um, in uh, red. So to find correlations in the between the two is more difficult than with uh, volcano tectonic events. First, because, I mean, we are in a tropical area, so we have rain in a nearly constant way. However, you have sometimes, like for example, in 2013, where yeah, you have a lot of rain that is followed by uh, the largest increase of the rockfall activity. However, just one year before, you have the same amount of rain, but no rockfall activity later. So it's a bit more difficult to really link the, the two phenomena. So now to try to link the external forcings with the rockfall activities in a um, better way to see better and to also be more sure of the significance of what we observe, we did some uh, statistical tests. So for this, here I will I show you an example for the volcano tectonic events, but we did exactly the same for the rainfall I will show you after. So I cut again my, uh, my 10 years catalog in different periods. And for each period, I take every single rockfall, and I look at the number of uh, volcano tectonic events before and after. And I stack these uh, numbers for all the rockfalls. So it's wor what I show you here. The vertical red line is the time zero. It's the time of the rockfalls. And the uh, black lines are the stack of the cumulative number of volcano tectonic events before and after. So I chose a regular time scale for uh, the activity after the rockfall, but I represent it uh, with a reverse uh, time scale for the activity before the rockfall, 
This is to be able to see uh, more clearly a potential asymmetry between what is happening before and after the rockfall. So if you take the plot on the left, you see that the two black lines are exactly symmetrical. And so this means that the rockfalls are not preceded by more volcanotectonic events. So that in the end, the volcanotectonic events doesn't, do not have any impact on the rockfall activity. Now, if you take the right hand plot, you see a clear dissymmetry between the two black lines. And this means that we have more volcanotectonic activity before the rockfalls. And so that potentially this uh, volcanotectonic activity triggered the rockfalls. But now, yeah, it's we observe this, but is it significant or not? To be sure, it's significant. We compared with some uh, simulations using a random uh, catalogs. So we take our rockfall catalogs, we shuffle it, we compare it to uh, the volcano tectonic event distribution that stays the same, and we do the same, computing the number of events before and after for hundreds of uh, simulations, hundreds of uh, random catalogs. And the dashed gray lines that uh, you see on these plots are actually showing the simulation domain. So if I have a asymmetry in my black lines, but that they both fell in the simulation domain, what I observe is not significant. But if it's clearly out of the simulation domain, like we have here, it is significant. And I can interpret it as the volcanotectonic events triggered the rockfalls. So now I will take you on each uh, period over this uh, these ten years of uh, of data. So first, we look at the post collapse period, and as we already see, um, I mean, as we already saw, we have no particular pattern with the black curves. So here you have the volcanotectonic activity, and below it's the rainfall. So for the seismic activity, for the rainfall, we have a symmetry in the two curves, and so. Nothing. I mean, the rock falls are just uh, happening because of the collapse and are not influenced by any external fac factors. Now, if we look during the period with no seismic activity, so where the rainfall is uh, dominant, we see that the rainfall is uh, slightly more important before the rockfall occurrences. So it's on this plot here below. You see that we have a slight asymmetry in the black line and that we are outside of the simulation domain. So we have influence of the rainfall on the rockfall activity. Finally, for me, the most interesting is uh, two periods where we have the eruptions and uh, most of the volcanotectonic activity. So if we look first at the rain, yeah, we don't have any clear influence of the rain on the rockfalls. But now if you look at the volcanotectonic uh, events, we clearly have an asymmetry for the two periods. So for the two periods, we have more volcanotectonic events before the rockfalls, and so they trigger the rockfalls. One interesting thing is that we have a kind of a small band here around 10 days that actually correspond to the delay between the maximum activity of uh, the seismicity and the occurrence of the rockfall in several cases. So we have, when the slopes are maybe more stable, a delay between the triggering uh, factor, that are the seismic events, and the slope response. So to summarize uh, the results for the temporal analysis, so first, yeah, we see that the seismicity and the rainfall both destabilize the slopes. When we have both activities, it's be difficult to really discriminate between the two, but the tests that we did show that uh, the, the seismicity seems to be the main triggering factor for the slope destabilization on the, uh, on the volcano. And what I think really interesting is that what we see here is that even low magnitude seismicity, because it is repeated, can destabilize the slopes. So it has been observed already um, with some seismic clusters that triggered some landslides uh, in some regions. 
but it was only uh, punctual observations. Here, we observe that in a repeated way. I mean, each time we have a repeated low magnitude seismicity, we have a rock falls after. And can change our point of view on the triggering of the landslides by uh, or the slope instabilities by uh, seismicity, because it's usually things that um, it's usually thought that uh, earthquakes of magnitude lower than four cannot destabilize the slopes. But if they are enough events happening in a long enough time, it actually can. Then we observe also a dependency of the slopes uh, response on their uh, stability state. So when the slopes are very, very unstable, they actually fail in a spontaneous way and they are not at all responsive to the external forcings. But when the slopes are more stable, they actually respond to the forcings. And if they are really, really more stable, they can uh, respond with a delay. So we have three behaviors. One where there is no uh, response of the slopes to the external forcings because anyway, they are um, destabilized. Then we have a case where they are more stable, but still uh, close to the unstabilization uh, threshold. And so they respond very easily to the external forcings. And then when they are much more stable, we need a bit more effort to uh, destabilize them. So to try to understand the mechanisms uh, behind these uh, behaviors, we compared uh, our observations, so our field observation to some uh, lab experiments. So the lab experiments um, show first that the decrease of the maximum uh, stability angle, that actually when you apply some vibration uh, to your media, this vibration will decrease the stability angle of your um, granular medium. And so it will trigger more easily the, it will trigger the collapse. Uh, then uh, you have uh, some, uh, I mean, usually it's a healing that is uh, dominating, but if you put some vibrations, you have some acoustic lubrication, and this will lead to the failure um, via some sliding and damage nucleation. And finally, where we can also really compare to uh, the Piton Lafones volcano, that is a cohesive um, medium, and where we have at some point some stable and short burst vibration with uh, seismicity, we see that when you have this cohesive material, and if you don't have the vibrations that are lasting long enough, you will observe a delay for the failure even in the lab experiments. So I leave you with uh, some conclusions where, uh, I mean, I think the two main conclusions are that the low amplitude seismicity, when it is repeated, has a predominant triggering effect on the destabilization of the slopes, at least on the Piton Lafones volcano, and that the efficiency of the triggering factors and the response time of the slopes depend on the stability state of uh, these uh, slopes. Thank you for your attention. Fabulous talk. Thank you very much, Virginia. I will invite people to yeah, unmute and join me in thanking or using your reaction features. Everyone's doing it. It's great. Yeah, really interesting talk. Lots of fun things to think about. I have many questions, and I will invite people to, uh, yeah, raise your hands. Easiest way to put ourselves in order. The reaction button at the bottom of your screen is a good way to do that. It ends up looking like this. I assume everyone's an expert on it, but um, that's what it looks like. And um, we are first going to go to uh, Ryan Schultz, but I would really like to encourage everyone to participate unless they, maybe especially I want to encourage early career people because uh, there's a lot of people who don't need any encouragement like Men in Dream Mayor or Massimo Coco. They don't, they don't need encouragement. Other people, I encourage you to uh, join in the discussion and ask questions. Ryan, please do. Hey, yeah, so a very nice talk, Virginia. Um, the part where you're saying that that looks like some aftershock-like process I thought was really cool and how you're talking about the difference between the internal and external forcing. It almost 
sort of nicely sets it up to be modeled as something just ETOS like um, where you have in this particular case, the advantage where you have data that you can input as like the external forcing term and something like that. Um, did, did you try to do anything like that or am I getting too far ahead of myself? Or, uh, I'm, I am sorry, it's a bit difficult for me to understand. Can you repeat the last part of your question, please? Yeah, so, so you've set this up in a way um, where there was something to do with aftershock like processes, which is very similar to like the epidemic type aftershock sequences and earthquakes where they, they model it as two terms, one related to the aftershock processes, like self-exciting, the internal part. Um, but then there's a second part where there's, um, let's say, some sort of background tectonic stressing, um, which in your case, you have maybe, or you, you have two hypotheses for what you think are going to be um, that external forcing in this case that you could use as um, like time series data to put in or something like that, yeah. Yeah, so no, we didn't do this uh, this other test. Um, to be honest, we were really quite excited that some uh, actually tools and models uh, for the used for the earthquake were actually applying pretty nicely to the rock falls. And for this yeah. uh, kind of first study, we stopped uh, there. So we just did this uh, Omori, uh, Omori stimula simulations. Though I also tried with some um, gamma low um, uh, fitting, and it worked sometimes well, but uh, yeah, it was a bit more tricky. So I guess it's also where I should have two different um, uh, forcings also. But yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't go into details for uh, for that now. Okay, no, just I'm um, curious. If there was any follow up on that? So thank you. But there is a lot of things to do still on this data. <laughs> mm -hmm. Virginia, what a beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about slide 11, which was where you showed us some things about um, energy estimates. Um, and we talked about the different colors that were there. Because it, it made me think right away, well, you have a perfect opportunity to talk about seismic efficiency, I think. Because you're... Your seismic energy your, is coming from the seismogram, right? Yes, yeah. And then you also have this other me me measure of potential energy changes, both from photogrammetry and other things, right? Uh, photogrammetry, I mean, it's a static image. We just have the total volume. Right, but you have it, you made an estimate of the potential energy change. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you mean meant by yeah, this, yes. I well, so, and so maybe it's already obvious and I just don't see it, but what is the what is your estimate of the ratio of these two things? Like if you ask the question of how much energy is radiated seismically versus versus just released in other ways? Um yeah, it's a good question. I need to check in the in the paper. I don't remember the value exactly, but uh yeah, it's uh, three orders. Of magnitude or something like that. Yeah. So it's exactly this ratio, right? This thing you call R here. Yeah. And um, yeah, okay. So we, I'll, I'll go and look as well. But that's always an interesting question with earthquakes, right? Is that how much energy is actually radiated versus versus expended in other other ways? Yeah, it's true that here we used it, yeah, for computing the volumes. And we, yeah, we checked the, the value by saying, okay, it's coherent, but we say we didn't go into details. Our aim was really to have a catalog of uh, mm -hmm. events and uh, we didn't go into detail of uh, every, every event or, uh, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, other questions people would like to join in? Joan, go ahead. I have uh, two questions. The first, apologize if you already mentioned it. So is there, are there, do you, did, you mentioned places where it was uplifting and subsiding and collapsing. Um, that's another external forcing that you're changing the topography. 
um, do some of the variations in the rock falls correlate or correspond to the geodet the uplift in the subsidence? So it may have nothing to separate the sort of quasi-static deformation from the shaking. Yeah, so we did the test uh, looking at, so we had, we have, uh, if I go back to the map, maybe here, I don't know if you can see, we have uh, seismic, uh, sorry, GNSS stations at the op on the opposite sides of the crater in uh, two perpendicular directions. So we looked at the uh, inflation and deflation of the volcano through time, and we compared it to the rockfalls activity and we did exactly the same test as for the volcano tectonic events but actually this uh, deformation is very slow it's taking several days several weeks and so it doesn't have a direct impact on the triggering of the rockfalls but it still plays a role like the gravity so it's more what we would call a loading a long-term loading but not the uh, dynamic triggering for example so we really see this difference. And the other question is about the the availability of slide surfaces and whether you re do you see evidence? I, I guess one way to look test it would be to look for repeating events. Um, are you resliding the same surfaces? Um, or can you even say, and in like many aftershock models, there's some assumption that there's this kind of infinite reservoir of potential failures. But you mentioned looking at sort of the B value changes that the availability of certain blocks or types of failures gets depleted and then rejuvenates. Can you? Yeah. So it, it seems that uh, actually we have a variation uh, through time. So the most striking for me is when you look at uh, this map um, here, where we have this uh, large orange circle so that represents the largest rockfalls on the period. And here they are active at, uh, in uh, it's, uh, 2011. And then you look at the four years after, and during four years, you have nothing. I mean, you have only very small events. You don't have uh, these large earth, uh, rock falls anymore. But four years later, you again have some, let's say, moderate to large uh, rock fall occurring in the same area. So it seems that, yeah, they can re-rupture, but they need time to reload. So can you... How do you decouple that from the effect, say, of the rain? Yeah, actually, uh, here on this four years, there is only rain. There is no seismicity. So it seems that uh, in this case, the rain is not an efficient enough factor to destabilize again this uh, part of the crater. Whereas when we have the seismic activity, either it's just that the slopes are uh, mature and they can fail, or it's the seismicity is more efficient than the rain. This, I have nothing to, to discriminate between the two. Okay. But yeah, what I can say is that we have some areas that are re-rupturing, but they need a reloading time. Okay, great, great work. Thank you. And as we go to Massimo Coco's question, um, continue to encourage people to participate. Please raise your hand and ask a question or make a comment. Massimo. Yeah, Virginie, thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, it was coming in my mind. One uh, good uh, step forward would be to install a um, high frequency GPS receiver on the area. Because in that case, you will have both the long-term uh, uh, GPS motion, as you just answered to John. But at the same time, you can see if you have some high-frequency uh, perturbation. And, and and the question is that uh, would be possible that dynamic the, the 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 wave the waves 
simply can be somehow transformed in a normal stress perturbation to the dynamic system, because if this is the case, uh, that should be more efficient in particular the frequency range. Since uh, when you have a stable dynamic system like a spring slider and you apply normal stress perturbation, if the slider is uh, stable, like it could be in your uh, steady state period, the effectiveness of normal stress change only occur at a given wavelength. And it would be good to check if this wavelength corresponds to the size of the surface participating or portion of the surfaces participating in the rock folds. Yeah, it's actually a very good point that uh, yeah, we didn't investigate at all. I didn't do a study depending on the frequencies of the waves that we have. And uh, yeah, it would be interesting actually to to see yeah for the moment what we yeah what we conclude is that it's really the the accumulation of the vibrations but uh yeah no it's uh, i cannot say i ju just can say that uh, yeah we should try <laughs> we... yeah thanks jessica hawthorne nice to see you please go ahead yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. It was really fun. Um, I think I have a kind of a similar question. Um, why are the, so you have the number of uh, earthquakes before and after kind of cumulative, um, and their lines. What should they be linear? Is that telling me that it's the cumulative number that matters? And I thought they should be curves. That you should see more just after. That, that if if there is an inst a, a quick response, then you would see a rapid ramp up just at the time of the rock fall and then kind of tail off. But that's not what you see. And so what should I learn from that? You mean this here? Yeah. So Why here's that? the black curves are the volcano tectonic events. And so the volcano tectonic events have an influence on the rock falls, but the rock falls do not have any influence on the volcano tectonic events. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm yes. not sure I have the question. So the question is why are the black curves actually quasi-linear instead of like concave down? Uh, so the linear feature can comes mainly from the stack. Actually, if I take individual curves, they are sometimes a bit curved, but not in the way that you're that you're saying. I mean if you took an after earthquake if you took earthquakes and just looked at in clustering, you wouldn't see lines. Because the I mean the volcano tectonic events is continuous in time and the rockfall activity can begin during the seismic crisis. So we have some seismic events after also, but they are not linked to the rockfalls. Yeah, I, I, okay. I... Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I am not sure I fully understand the question. Yeah, I'm not sure I fully, I think I'm trying to understand whether, like, if if they're linear, so one, one kind of model you could say is, well, oh, after I have 10 volcano tectonic events, I'll have a rocks fall of X size. And that would give you, I think, a nice linear curve like what you have. Whereas if you said, oh, but the influence of a rock fall influence of a volcano tectonic event has a decaying influence. Like if you had, if you did perfect ETAS, right, it had a decaying influence, so it wouldn't have any influence 10 minutes or 20 minutes later, then you would get, I think, concave down, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I got it now. So I think that uh, this is due maybe to the time uh, that I take here for the plot. I take only 15 days before because I make the hypothesis from all the visual investigations that I did before, that um, 
the average time of influence of this cumulative seismicity is 15 days. So if I continue, I take longer periods, yeah, you will see a kind of a decrease uh, in the number of volcano tectonic. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. John Garber, go ahead. Sorry. Just a, a question really related to Massimo's question about the time variability uh, of the forcing in the laboratory experiments. And maybe you mentioned it, uh, sorry. Is, is there a, in terms of this destabilization of the slopes in the laboratory experiments, is there a frequency or duration effect or does that have a bearing on the destabilization? Yeah, I think there is a frequency uh, influence, um, but uh, right now I cannot tell you what I should reread the papers and uh, discuss. Actually, I don't know if he's there, uh, Xiaopin, if he's around, but uh, yeah, he did all the lab experiments. And I remember that we talked of frequency at one point, but uh, yeah, I would say yes, but I, I don't know the details. Okay, just curious, thanks. You know, there's always a possibility of following up, Joe, of course, and uh, it's one of the points that um, I would like to make just out loud. Um, we're still, uh, yeah, in the discussion is that there's lots of people who watch these uh, talks on um, YouTube afterward, and uh, I would encourage you, people who are watching this talk but not here live, to just get in touch with Virginia directly with your question. Tomas, please go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. So I had a question. Uh, thank you for, for your talk. Um, uh, so you compared the, the B value uh, with, uh, with the B value uh, of earthquake distributions. Uh, but to what extent is it meaningful to, to, to why do you wait for the, this value to be equal when you compare a volume distribution and a magnitude distribution? Uh, actually, I was not expecting them to be equal. It was okay. kind of a surprise, but uh, yeah, I called it also gutenberg Tolo because we have the same um, logarithmic scale. I mean, the magnitude uh, is the logarithmic scale and uh, what we have on the x-axis here, it's also, I mean, it's like if I had put on this minus one, zero, one, two, so the representation is the same as for to get a but I was not expecting that. Uh, it, it was just by curiosity that I did this uh, frequency distribution, and uh, mm. yeah, it's not exactly the same as um, earthquakes because each time we have a value that is a bit uh, smaller than one. But yeah, it's you know, we have a kind of a similarity, and it was more yeah concerning the the lowest volume that we could detect. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, curiosity, but I, don't, I actually don't even explain it why we have the same behavior. Yeah, I don't. I have no idea. Uh, yeah, if we can, uh, what kind of information we could take from this? Uh, so I, I, I will uh, think about it. Thank you. Yes, yeah, an interesting point. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but I want to start with the one that came from uh, Jessica Hawthorne as well, because I had a similar question. Uh, where did you start those plots? On like slide 19, was it maybe, Virginia, where you showed us those? Uh, yeah, the. Um, can you help me? Can you re explain the plot on the right? Because the one on the left, I think I understand, and the one on the right, I'm not sure I do. So they are the same plots. It's just for two different periods. And uh, there is so the one of the left during the period, it's during the crater collapse. So we have the symmetry between the, the two lines. So we can say that there is no impact of the volcano tectonic events on the rock falls. The second plot here is actually during this period uh, from 2010 to 2011. And what it means is that I have 
um, volcano tectonic activity that is higher before the rock falls. So if I didn't have any impact of the volcano no, tectonic events on the rock fall, I would expect that before, after, I have the same number of uh, seismic events. But here I have more before. I and see. so because I have more before in a systematic way, I say that, uh, okay, there is a link between the volcano tectonic activity and the rockfall uh, triggering. Yeah, I understand. Okay, but um, the, if I just look at the topology of the plot, maybe it's because of the time period that you show, but don't you expect if I go back, um, you know, farther and farther in time, shouldn't I expect this line to to level out and be concave yes. down? That's like I was talking. Yeah, yes, so, yes, yes. So it, it, it's linear over this time period, but if I make it longer in one way or another, it won't be. Yes, it it begins to yeah to be concave, but actually, I think that the there is a small problem is that we don't have much. A lot of time in between uh, seismic sure. activities. We will have sure. again. Uh, we will see again the impact of the yeah. of the volcano. But activity. the other thing that I wonder about with these plots, maybe you are, have already worked it out. But you know, as I approach the time zero here, and maybe it's in, on either side, do I have to worry about missing events if there's a if there's a you know, a catastrophic sequence of events, and I have a kind of a, a you know a blindness to the smallest events. If I'm just counting them, do I do I have to do I worry about that, or I don't need to worry about it? Well, uh, first I chose to take the volumes greater than hundred cubic meters, and I think we are quite robust for all the period of time. Biggest ones, right? Right. Wait, there's 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 a ten to the five of those. Uh, no, so ten to the five is a stack of the of the volcano tectonic events. So we have actually, yeah, I, I don't remember the number of uh, rock falls, but we have thousands of rock falls, and we stack the the numbers of uh, volcano tectonics. So it's thousand times other thousand. I see. I see. That have its uh, powers. But to answer your previous question, we did exactly the same test for 5,000 cubic meters and 10,000 cubic meters, and we still have this tendency of the asymmetry of the volcano tectonic events before and after. Excellent. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Massimo, go ahead. Yeah, it is related to this point. Because if I look just to the raw data, I would interpret that while volcanic tectonic events are not stationary, they are clustered in time, which is not the case of the rock falls, which are much more uh, distributed in time, even if you have some clustering as well. But the clustering properties, uh, if I can just uh, infer them by visually on these plots, I would say that the clustering would be different. So, and therefore, uh, this is related to the Jessica question. When I see this linear behavior in these two plots, uh, I was tempted to say that the clustering properties are the same. They are linearly. So you have the constant rate of production of earthquakes before and after. So mm -hmm. how much this depends on the facts that here you are taking 15 days. So if you simply, instead of looking at the stacking with 15 days, you change to seven days of 25, do you still see this behavior? Because so it is... Yeah, you go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I tried to, uh, actually at the beginning, I looked at 30 days and uh, yeah, I had this uh, concave uh, tendency and yeah, shorter times, I I still have the linear tendency, this for sure. But uh, yeah, if I take a longer uh, time time scale, yeah, it's it's pretty linear at the beginning, but after, no, it's uh, it's decreasing, yeah. Yeah, but in any case, this is interesting because uh, many times with the precursors uh, in earthquakes, in seismology, we see people that they simply correlate in time to time series and they simply visually uh, infer that there is a correlation. In this mm -hmm. case, honestly, at least to me, if I look at the, these two plots on the top of this figure 
and you would ask me which is better correlated, which is the, the, the parent, which is the children, I would bet for the rainfall, not for the volcanic tectonic, but your conclusion is just the opposite. Because you see that they are much more visually, they are almost distributed in time, they are um, more or less clustered, of course, because the intensity, they change, but uh, yeah, that, that is interesting. I think that uh, you, you you are proposing perhaps a much more robust uh, uh, analysis uh, tool than no, maybe the visual interpretation. My way of saying the things, I, I don't know, because yeah, from the plot also of the rain, I can say that the background, let's say that uh, I don't know, for example, this activity here, if I take the constant level of activity, it might be either just triggered by the gravity and um, it's falling, let's say, alone, or by the rain. What I wanted to investigate here, it's all these increases in uh, the rockfall activity. What are they due to? And so I focused re really on, when I say, ah, yeah, we have a triggering of the rockfall activity, it's a triggering of a highest, higher rockfall activity than the normal rate. So I don't know if it makes a difference or not. No, no, it is clear. Your goal is clear. I was just uh, trying, uh, yeah, like Jessica, to, to better understand why it is linear in both sides, even if the slope is changed. And I also would expect uh, that somehow you should diverge from linearity if uh, the, there is a, a cause effect relationship, but perhaps I'm wrong. Yeah. But if, if I take a longer time, it's not linear anymore. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Other questions from people? I still have one more, if you don't mind, Virginia. On slide 18, um, you showed us this uh, divergence from um, Omori, and maybe I I was expecting that we were going to understand something about why does it diverge right there. Is uh, it... I think I mean it's a hypothesis, but I think that um, like we observe uh, aftershocks for a given time after uh, earthquakes, so we have the duration of the relaxation of the milieu that is uh, let's say finite it's a bit, bit the same here that after two years and a half in the end the slopes are pretty much um, drained by uh, the collapse and they are not unstable enough anymore to just fall by themselves but if there is a external excitation they right. will fall and uh, I think it's what we can see here. Yeah. Well, it's, it's surprising, or maybe not, it's interesting how that persists through this um, series of uh, events in 2009, series of eruptions in 2009. Yeah, it's... but the, the hypothesis that we do there is really that it doesn't need anything to fall. So actually, we will have the seismicity. But the the window of influence of the seismic events is so short that it's not significant. I mean, um, it's it's not enough for the seismicity to really have an impact. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful data set. Yeah. This yes. <laughs> and there is uh, still a lot of analysis to be done. <laughs> Other questions, comments. Someone would like to chime in? Okay, well, if not, I will invite you to unmute and um, maybe turn your camera on if you'd like to join me in thanking Virginia for a fabulous talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>